Hi everyone. Every now and then I like to do a Q&A video just to thank my wonderful loyal subscribers for the amazing feedback, the fascinating comments, and all of the fascinating questions also that I get on the channel. So I put out a call for questions about two weeks ago and received a very large number of amazing questions in response. If I haven't gotten to your question this time, it's just because there were so many of them and you can always ask it again, of course, next time I do one of these. As always, I'm giving priority to my patrons. It's only fair. So if you want to support the channel, you can do so at www.patreon.com slash Samuel Andreev. There will be a link in the video description for that. So let's get on to the questions. So Andres Buxo Lugo writes, Are there any pieces of music that you associate with big lessons you gained early in your listening slash composing career? As in, this piece by X totally changed how I thought about rhythm, or understanding this one piece taught me a lot about orchestration, etc. Yes, absolutely. There's a number of pieces I can think of. So, for example, in terms of orchestration, there are two early Schoenberg pieces that are just absolutely amazing in their breadth of accomplishment and their innovations and just how amazingly fertile his sonic imagination was. The thing that amazes me about these early Schoenberg orchestra pieces is really just he didn't have a million chances to sort of try out the, these experiments with an orchestra and see how they sounded. These are early attempts, uh, quite early on in his career, and they're very very audacious and they work. That's the thing that's really amazing about them. So pieces like the Gourre Leader, certainly, which is just uh, amazing. I mean, there are so many innovations in that orchestration. And again, it works. You can you can hear these in the most incredible sounds. The, the massive group of flutes that you hear in the opening bars, for example, with the piccolos and the, the use of the English horn with this little leitmotif that you hear in the beginning of the piece. Uh, so many little touches like that are just absolutely amazing. I don't know where they come from really either because the the orchestration in those pieces is so massive it's so rich it's a step beyond what even someone like Wagner was attempting and then in pieces like the the five orchestra pieces where you have things like the use of the contrabass clarinet that was not an everyday thing to do at that time and it's really incredibly effective or that that weird chord for three bassoons that runs throughout the the first movement it's like what's that doing in there i'm not really sure nobody else was attempting things like that at that time so those are two pieces. Um, then there are things like the Strauss Four Last Songs. Now that's a much more, I'm not going to say conventional piece exactly, but it's a, it's a more ordinary approach to the orchestra, but it's a highly virtuosic one, and you can learn quite a lot from studying that piece very closely. But I think the thing that really is remarkable about Strauss, and he has this in common with Wagner, incidentally, is it's, it, it's a highly blended form of orchestration, right? The instruments blend together into a single organic tapestry, like a single sonic entity that is unbelievably rich you can't very easily tell one instrument from another in that piece you know you don't you're not aware of individual soloistic instruments except you know in rare moments like when he brings in a solo violin in the last song and things like that the opposite extreme to that would be someone like Stravinsky so certainly the Rite of Spring made a huge impression on me when I was first starting to study composition as it does on virtually everybody who listens to that piece for the first time because it's just you know like a compendium of one amazing thing after after another, but it's the complete opposite approach to orchestration as what Strauss did. So in Stravinsky, rather than this sort of blending thing, you have this kaleidoscopic array of constantly changing timbres, and they're very, very specific ones. So he uses the E flat clarinet, he uses the bass trumpet, he uses the English horn, he uses the, you know, all of these instruments in very, very specific ways, and you're always aware of the instrument that you're hearing. It's almost always soloistic or a group of solo instruments that can be easily identified. It's very transparent. So in that sense, the Rite of Spring certainly made a huge impression just for this huge array of different constant, constantly changing soloistic combinations of instruments. So those are a couple. In terms of rhythm, the Boulez Second Sonata absolutely was just a complete mind bender when I first heard that. I mean, nothing else sounds like that piece. And the thing that's really impressive about it is how exaggerated it is, how extreme it is. It's like nobody else was attempting anything even remotely like this at the time that Boulez wrote that piece, which was in 1948. It certainly owes something to Messiaen and also to Messiaen's investigations into Indian rhythm for example, but the way Boulez uses these ideas, these materials, these rhythmic processes is so uh, personal and so unique and so thoroughgoing. I think it's just really amazing that someone that young, I think he was 22 or 23 when he started that piece, so it's just really 
incredible that he was able to do that so quickly. So that and then Gruppen is another one by Stockhausen. So, I mean, that's a piece that just is a triumph of the human imagination on every level. It's like orchestration, yes. Texture, yes. Form, yes. Just everything. It's like it's a completely new sounding sort of piece and it's a successful one and it's gripping. It's like you can't really do much more than that. That piece made a huge impression. And the thing is, all of these pieces that I just named are things that I'm still studying now. That's the thing, like decades later, I'm still, like, I still haven't figured these pieces out. There's still new things to discover in them. And I think that's really the hallmark of a great work. And I feel like I have a debt. I'm, I, like, I'm indebted to these pieces. I, it's like, this is a, a prod. It's like a spur saying, you know, can you do something this amazing? Can you, can you aim this high? Can you be this ambitious and pull it off? And that's something that I think is just a useful uh, approach to take in composition generally. It's like, how far can you go? Can you take gigantic, colossal risks? And it's better to do that, I think, and to fail than it is to aim for something sort of correct, but to succeed. So Bruno writes, I very much enjoyed your interview with Franck Pedrosian. I was wondering what your perspective is on Saturationisme and the composers associated with this label, such as Raphael Sendo, Yann Robin, etc. What do you think are the major achievements of this kind of post-spectralist music, and what may be its shortcomings? Well, the achievements, well, those are, those are easy to name. So those are three composers that uh, made a huge impression when they first came on the scene in Paris in the early 2000s. So I know all of them personally. And in fact, two of them were classmates of mine. I was a student at the Paris Conservatory at the same time as Jan Robin and also as Raphael Sendo. So I had many encounters with these people. And, and Franck actually was uh, my first teacher when I moved to France. So I know all three of them rather well. I was certainly struck by the exaggeration. Again, that's a quality that I admire in music when a composer can uh, can not just sort of do something timidly and sort of make a little inroads into you know a new idea, but but really goes at it with full force and and invents an entirely new world with great imaginative power. Uh, that's something to pay attention to always, and it's more important once again than questions of you know whether the piece succeeds or not. I think is a secondary question. So the uh, the imaginative force, I would say, uh, and also the, the exaggeration, the intensity of those pieces was something that I found impressive. Now, in terms of the way that music is talked about, it's often presented as being something very much of the moment, being something deeply innovative. And what I would tend to do is to point out that it's actually deeply connected with certainly spectralism. I mean, it's a direct descendant of spectralism, clearly. It's, a, it's like an outbranching of uh, of the things that Murail and uh, Griset and Dufour and others were developing in the 1970s and beyond, braided together with the instrumental innovations of Lachenmann. So it's those two things together, but it also has roots in other music of the 1960s and 1970s, such as the orchestral pieces of Zanakis and, uh, and Ligeti, certainly. So you know, it, it's it's very much indebted to these earlier composers and also to things like rock and metal music and things like that. And so it's, I think it's innovative in the sense that it, it brings together things that it's maybe not obvious to bring together. But I have to say, it made a gigantic impression uh, on the generation of composers that I was uh, associated with in Paris. Uh, it didn't have a huge impact on my own practice because my own preoccupations were extremely different. But this particular melding together of Lachenmann and spectralism is something that was hard to get away from in Paris in the 2000s and still is to, to a large extent. I mean, the, for some reason, those, those two particular currents or directions just uh, really dominated things for quite a long time. The next question comes from Eric. Hi Samuel, what do you see to be the current state of music's relationship to other art forms? My sense is that there is not as much communication between artists of different disciplines as there was in the past, and I wonder if you share this view or have any extended thoughts on it. Well, Eric, I disagree with the premise of the question, actually, because I don't think that's true. I don't know what the basis would be for making such an argument. You might be referring to really highly publicized, highly sort of written about partnerships and, and cross-pollinations of the type Nietzsche Wagner, for example, or Beethoven Goethe, or, or Schoenberg Kandinsky, the sort of expressionist connection. I think that there's a huge difference between those times and the times we currently live in, which is on on one level, there are far more artists that are practicing. I mean, you, you can't get away from that. There's just 
you know, I, I talked with the poet Kenneth Goldsmith about this on my channel a couple of months ago. You can watch that interview if you're interested. But Kenny's point of view on that was there are so many people practicing now that you're just not going to get these towering giant figures that dominated the earlier part of the 20th century. It's just not set up that way. And it's not a reflection on people's talent or their quality as as artists. It's just that the the floodgates have opened, right? The, the, the gatekeepers that used to determine what pieces would be played and not be played and, and the, the power of publishers and of record labels, labels and all of that has obviously diminished enormously and the internet has just democratized everything and you know there's, there's just this gigantic flood of art coming from all directions and it's very hard to, to sort through that so i think it's just it's not as obvious maybe what the striking work is that's being done today you might have to look a little bit harder to find it and you might have to cut through a sea of noise also to get to those things that are really remarkable also people are working in just so many different directions and different media now that it's it's kind of hard to put a name to some of these things so i know a lot of composers who are writing things that are only really peripherally composition in my view like so pieces that don't even necessarily have a score but that involve improvisation or they, they, they might involve multimedia dimensions they might involve the, the visual arts they might involve dancing uh, lights scenography of various kinds musical theater and there's a lot of stuff like this going on and a lot of these are like unique events that can't really be reproduced they have connections to the happenings also of the 1960s and lots of other things so there's just so much of that work being done that it's it would be hard for me to to say i agree with you that that there's no sort of a sense of crossover between the arts. I don't think that's true. In my own practice, I've been deeply, deeply affected by painting and by poetry and uh, and by literature of all kinds, and that certainly uh, very much affected my my outlook. So I got to say I disagree with that one. So the next one is from Michael McGuffin, who says, "I used to think there was a deep mystery in what makes a melody." Or a sequence of chords sound interesting and pleasing, but I've learned that there are principles governing the choice of notes and chords in Western music and algorithms for generating music, an impressive example being David Cope's software Emmy, described most clearly in Chapter 2, written by Douglas Hofstadter in Cope's book Virtual Music. There are even some quite simple algorithms that generate pleasing melodies and chord sequences. Recently, Apple bought a company developing software to generate custom soundtracks. Is much of Western music much more shallow than I had previously suspected? What are your thoughts on this? It's true that there are aspects of musical syntax that we can now teach computers to understand and replicate with seeming facility. So for example, you know, it's not actually hard at all to teach a computer to connect together uh, different chords and create a pleasing chord sequence or to invent melodies. This is in fact not even a terribly new technology. But I think all that that tells us is that there are aspects of musical syntax that can be formalized and described in very specific technical terms. And those sorts of things are simply not hard to teach computers to do. But it doesn't really get at the heart of what makes a composition great. So for example, uh, if you take the beginning of the dissonance quartet of Mozart, that's something that goes beyond questions of syntax. It goes beyond, you know, writing a, a pleasing melody or making a nice collection of sounds. There's something in there that is surprising because the, the different decisions that the composer had to make in order to get there, in order to write a piece like that, are surprising. I mean, it's not, it's not a, a logical or an expected outgrowth of earlier pieces of Mozart or of things that his colleagues were doing. It's like he's veering off into a new direction. And those are precisely the sorts of things that a computer cannot very easily manipulate at this point. Maybe, you know, it'll, they'll develop that capacity to invent things that are not contained within the technical or syntactical premise of the music but things that, that are, are sudden departures. If AI is going to become more powerful and, and do things that are artistically really compelling, then it's going to have to do things like that, I would think. But then again, uh, there are really quite amazing things that have been done. There's a quite famous instance of poetry written by a computer. Uh, it's a book called The Policeman's Beard is Half Constructed, and it's written by a program called Racter, R-A-C-T-E-R. -E and this is a, an often cited example of you know what computers can do and it's this it's actually quite an amazing piece of uh, of writing it's a it's a quite a hilarious text also i suspect that there's going to be a realm of things that humans can do that is extremely hard to teach machines how to do and that's going to be our province but then there's going to be things that we currently can do that machines are going to get very good at doing and we're not going to want to do those things anymore because machines can do them better and there are going to be certain types of music i'm sure 
that uh, will lend themselves more easily, perhaps, to that sort of thinking, that sort of formalization. You, know, you can imagine a computer just spitting out endless numbers of Muzak compositions that are way better than current Muzak, for example, like way more interesting and surprising, and just you know generating millions of them with the click of a single button. You know that that could happen. That could happen. So Alexander Prehauser writes. What does beauty still mean? How is it that some composers create things that are undoubtedly intended to be beautiful, but cannot easily be perceived as such? I would put Messiaen and Stockhausen in this category, while others, like Babbitt, seem aghast at the notion of beauty itself. And most importantly, how can we bridge the divide between the art world and the public? Is it inevitable, like Babbitt argued, or is it a function of capitalist production, as Adorno said? I always thought Tolkien gave us a possible way out, as he found a way to earnestly rejuvenate the forms of the past. The other way that I would like to pursue is to develop not serialist philosophy, but its analysis to such a degree that it is able to encompass all traditions in a formal framework that both exhibits what makes them unique and what makes them similar. The category of the beautiful is incredibly elastic and unstable. You know, it's, it's not like this is a immutable, undying thing that changes, that stays the same throughout the ages and is the same in every culture. It's like, no, it's, it's unbelievable, unbelievably fluid. You would be tasked with the difficult job of defining the beautiful, uh, and it changes all the time. It changes not just from one culture to another, but also within cultures. So the, the category of, of what we consider to be beautiful is by no means a fixed category. I hate to say the obvious, but it's obviously something very subjective. So, you know, I could find tremendous beauty in a composition of Babbitt, whereas somebody else might find it to be just a, a sea of incomprehensible noise. I don't know what's to be done about that. I don't know if there's a uh, if that's necessarily a reflection of the composer's feeling that beauty isn't important. I don't think that's true. I think that what some people find beautiful may be something that is stimulating and surprising. The sensation of something being beautiful might be the sensation of discovering something new, something fresh, something that nobody's heard before. And that something might of necessity be surprising and unexpected and difficult to understand and to recognize at first. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not beautiful. It can take a long time to appreciate new forms of beauty. This is something that we see, certainly, in, if you look at the history of painting or poetry or, or composition, that this, uh, this is something that, that is constantly being revised. I think that there are pieces that will probably never be considered beautiful by most people, but you know, who cares? It's like art is not a democratic pursuit in that sense. Art is not a consensus sport, right? Is we don't have to make things that please everybody. Uh, there, are, you know, there are there are wonderful pieces of art that are only ever going to appeal to like ten people, but to those ten people, it's like just the thing. It's amazing. You know, it's something that can change their life. I've had that experience. You know, of course, you want to share it with other people, but you have to accept at a certain point that not everything is for everybody. And that doesn't mean it's bad, and it doesn't mean it's not beautiful. So Sazruko writes, Why do you think certain chords, keys, sequences of notes tend to feel happy and others sad? Can you shed any light on the historical factors that might have influenced the formation of this truism in our musical culture? Why those specific emotions, i.e. happy slash sad, and why not some other set of emotions? My sense is that it might be because these emotions are fundamental to the human experience, and we sense them being reflected back at us, when we experience music. I have some difficulty with the terminology of happy and sad. See, I don't think those actually describe human emotions particularly accurately. It's like, what about wistful? What about terse? What about nostalgic? What about the, the weird sort of forced cheer of some of those Shostakovich pieces where it sort of sounds happy, but you know that it's actually not? Uh, what about things like uh, superstition, Stevie Wonder, where it's in a minor key, but it's like relentlessly upbeat. You know, there, there are all kinds of sort of in-between emotions, emotions that don't even have names, emotions that are difficult to describe, that don't fit into those, that the sort of simple binary categorization. I think human beings are a lot more complex than that. Uh, I don't think happiness per se is, is, is something that's particularly an interesting concept even. Maybe a, a feeling of well-being that is characterized by the absence of I don't know, by the absence of any extraneous problems. But is that what a Mozart C major piece describes, really? You know, when, it, when it's sort of in a major key? I don't think so. I don't think so. So maybe you can make the argument that there's something maybe more wistful or reflective, or uh, maybe maybe minor keys are better at expressing the tragic, and that maybe major keys are better for dancing, and they're better for expressions of jubilation and, uh, and, and religious ecstasy and these sorts of things. Maybe you could make those those sorts of arguments. And I don't know that I would be ready to make them, and I don't think I would have the arguments necessary to, to make that case. You would probably have to, 
ask somebody who's more of an acoustician or somebody who is investigating the the sort of psychological properties of, of music. But again, I think it's very, very difficult category because, you know, the the way that art affects us aesthetically and emotionally is incredibly complex. And I don't think that the sort of laboratory experiments, you know, where they play Mozart to babies, and then they play a Stockhausen take, tape, and then they're like, see, babies like Mozart better. Um, I don't know that that really tells us very much about art, actually. So I'm very, very skeptical of those sorts of experiments. So Joao writes, from what I could gather, popular music has always or almost always been associated with or directed towards more whole body experiences and not just to the hearing slash intellect. This is probably made more definitive through the cultural influx of the African diaspora from which came concepts of music where dance and the psychophysical effects of music, among other things, were never dissociated from its fruition and raison d'être. My question is, what do you think that is and what characterizes the presence field of the body in contemporary music, not necessarily how it unfolds in other languages such as contemporary dance, but also if there is a concern or interest on the part of composers in thinking about the corporal, whole body aspect of contemporary listening. Okay, I think you're asking about how some contemporary compositions might appear abstract or disembodied, and it's not stuff that you can very easily dance to. It doesn't seem to be a, a corporeal experience necessarily. Well, uh, that's true to a large extent, actually, and I think that's something worth paying attention to as a phenomenon. So, you know, the poet Ezra Pound has this quote, which I'm going to butcher, but he basically said that when music gets too far from the dance, it wilts it withers. And there's something to that, I think. Uh, music is fundamentally about movement, and if there's you know, no way to connect a sensation of movement with something that we can relate to physically with our bodies, I think that that, uh, that can be a an issue for a lot of listeners, certainly. One of the things that I learned from teaching analysis and working with all kinds of students of all different ages is you know, we would look at Schoenberg pieces, the atonal pieces of Schoenberg, and, uh, and compare them to things like Scriabin or, or Wagner and things like that. And, the fact that the pieces were atonal didn't actually really matter all that much. In fact, a lot of people don't particularly notice the difference between extended tonality, you know, really chromatic form of tonality, and atonality. Uh, there's no firm line in the sand between those two things. So it's not so much the tonal language of these pieces that could appear difficult or disturbing for people. I think it's the absence of obvious patterns structuring the rhythm. I think that's something that's actually more significant than the organization of the tones in those pieces. Pattern recognition on some level, I think, is, uh, is really extremely important. But I think there are also composers that have been investigating things that are emphatically not corporeal, but things that are more like mental projections or more like, uh, let's say, spiritual in nature things that involve a kind of more meditative approach to sound. And this also comes directly from the lack of a, a real kind of bass function in music, right? When you get away from functional harmony, when you get away from the idea in particular of a bass line grounding the sound, the, the harmonies, then you end up with something that is much less physically grounded in a certain sense, or at least it, it's much less directional in nature. And so it can be perhaps harder to project a, a real sense of corporeal movement in that case. You know, music can do all sorts of things at the same time. Not everything necessarily needs to be for dancing, uh, despite what Mr. Pound had to say about it. You know, I could imagine a piece of music that consists of very subtle drones that, that slowly change over time that could be incredibly involving and captivating to listen to. You know, or something like Stockhausen's Stimmung, which is not particularly rhythmically exciting and that's fine. Or, the, you know, some of the Chelsea pieces for that matter. I, when I listen to Chelsea, I'm not really thinking of a corporeal gesture per se, although I, I might be thinking in terms of an instrumental gesture, which is an extension of the body, but it might, might not make me want to actually get out of my chair and start dancing. Uh, although maybe, you know, for maybe some people that would be the reaction they'd have. It's, it's hard to say. People are funny. So Joao writes, my question is regarding pitch organization in the 21st century. What techniques are the techniques of today? I feel like serialism, set theory, spectralism, etc. are all from the last century. So how does the 21st century composer organize pitch? And how does one think of pitch outside of the 12 tones? How do you, for example, think about pitch? I remember an Instagram post with some tone rows uh, on your violin concerto. The techniques do not make the music. The techniques are not the music, right? The, the, the tools that a composer uses to articulate what they have to say, to put the notes down on the page, are not the things that we directly interface with when we're listening to the piece. In fact, the techniques, 
used to put the piece together might have a very oblique, indirect relationship to what we hear, to what we perceive, and how the music affects us. So I think it's it's easy to put too much emphasis on you know the fact of using this or that technique because, well, because those things are easy to describe. So if you're giving a composition seminar, as I often do, the easy way out of the dilemma of you know what do you talk about in a situation like that is to show the students a bunch of charts and graphs and note tables and things like this and say, see, here's how I wrote my piece. But those things don't tell you anything because that's not where the piece is located. So I don't really believe that you can, you can very easily categorize pieces based on the fact that they happen to use microtones or they happen to use this or that type of pitch manipulation or this or, this, this or that type of rhythm. You have to look at the effect that the piece creates, the expressive effect, and how the piece makes you feel, the phenomenology of listening, what is your experience as a listener, um, the, the technique might be completely invisible. There are all sorts of pieces by Brian Fernieho, for example, where I have no idea how he made them. Yeah, I don't know what the techniques are. They're complicated. There's layer upon layer of, of sieves and, and weird manipulative techniques going on and, and rhythms invented using different programs and, and patchwork that he comes up with. And, I know he's doing those things. I don't know how he does them. I don't know how they affect what it is that I'm hearing necessarily, but I hear a very strong personality being projected. I hear something really very impressive, very, very uh, full of personality. So that's that's what I take away from those pieces. And the technique, that's his private business. You know, technique is the is the private business of composers when they're trying to get their notes down on paper. That's what it is. So don't obsess about those things. You know, find the the working process that suits you, that allows you to do what you need to do, it doesn't really matter that much what it is, I don't believe, as long as it's adequate to the expressive and aesthetic project that you want to explore. Jorge writes, do you consider atonality an increase in complexity or a downgrade without negative connotations in complexity? Is new complexity music atonal? Well, it's clearly an increase in complexity because the difference between a, a tonal piece of music and a 12-tone piece of music is that in the, in the tonal piece, the syntax, the glue that holds the piece together is outsourced, right? It's not contained only within that piece. It's something that exists in the broader musical culture uh, and that is uh, that belongs to, it's like a kind of common property of composers and listeners. There's something public about it. It's like it's public knowledge, it's public information, you know, in the, in the same sense that uh, that a bus shelter is a, is, is, is a public common thing. It's there for everybody to use, anybody who wants it. So these are relatively simple patterns. The process by which the diatonic scales formed over, over time throughout musical history is obviously a complex process, but the patterns themselves, you know, are relatively simple and they're very familiar. So when you hear a, a, a string quartet by Haydn, or a symphony by Beethoven, um, you know, you don't have to fundamentally rethink the nature of the musical materials every, so every time you sit down and hear a piece like that, because those are common materials. So they're very easy, it's, it's very easy to integrate the sort of syntactical dimensions of those pieces. 12-tone music is completely different because the pattern, the patterns that those pieces contain are specific to those pieces. They're not outsourced. And so the listener then has the more difficult job of calibrating their expectations inside that specific piece in terms of what might happen, what might, what might be a logical or, or an expected or a surprising thing to happen within the world of that piece. So it's definitely an increase in, in complexity. The patterns are more complex, they're much more abstract, and they're harder to memorize. It's incredibly hard to memorize 12-tone rows. I know a few people who do that sort of thing, which I suppose is, is maybe an indication of the sorts of friends that I have. But anyway, I'm not very good at that. I'm not terribly good at memorizing tone rows, and I don't think most people are or would bother to do it necessarily. But it's like those those patterns are really complex. And then when you get into serialism and you get multiple layers of abstract ordering going on on the level of pitch and rhythm and intensity and color and all of these different things, articulation, dynamics, and they're all overlapping and interacting in different ways. It's like you might be able to appreciate the constant renewal of musical materials in a piece like that as a listener, but without having the faintest idea how it's actually organized. And for composers, it's much more complex too, because you know, you can very easily do this experiment, like sit down at a piano, if you play a piano reasonably well, 
improvise a little piece in C major. Anyone can do this who plays a little bit of piano. It's like you, you play a couple of triads, you, you know, you move your, your right hand over the keys and then you can come up with a, you know, a, a melody in C major that sounds like a convincing melody in C major. If, if I were to say, here's a 12 tone row, go and improvise a, a string quartet using this row at the keyboard. Well, you can't do that. Uh, I don't think anyone can do that. M maybe there's some, you know, weirdo out there who's, you know, able to do things like that, but I, I, I don't think it's very common. Why? Because the patterns are way more complex. So it's an increase in complexity. That being said, where it gets a little bit paradoxical is that if you write music that's extremely complex, and it's always extremely complex, and it's extremely complex on every level all the time, then that paradoxically becomes simple. It becomes a form of, well, there, there, there's a form of predictability in that, right? Because it's always the same amount complex, and that, that, that dimension is not fluctuating particularly. So constant unchanging flow of, of complicated events one after the other can become a form of simplicity simply because we, we learn to predict that yes, the next event is going to be complex too, and so is the one after that, and it's just going to be complex all the way down the road. So having some kind of a dynamic fluctuation and the degree of complexity, the degree of surprise, the degree of consistency in a language is important, I think, to keep things interesting. So I've just got a few more. So Kamikaki writes, is it important for a composer to find their own voice? It's often presented that it's important, but I think that it may end up writing boring, generic music. No, it's not important. No, that's a cliche. That's a, finding your voice is a cliche. It doesn't actually mean anything. That's what creative writing teachers will say in workshops. You know, you have to find your own voice, you know, as though that meant anything. I think that what artists do generally is they, they find potential within their material, within their musical material, within the materials they're using for their paintings or whatever it might be. Uh, it's not so much about giving some kind of external form to their changing internal moods. I think that's, that's a bit of a romantic cliche. I think that artists, generally speaking, including the romantics, incidentally, are finding new potential in their musical material. They're finding things that nobody had seen before or had imagined doing, um, new ways of uh, imagining a, a composition. So no, I, I don't think you should go out and find your voice. I think, I think that would be a mistake. Um, I'm not particularly interested in people's individual voices. I'm, I'm interested in what can they do that will astonish me. So N. Gomez writes, how do I identify counterpoint in atonal music? How does one make good counterpoint? And how do you translate the musical ideas in your head onto paper? Oh, that's a really interesting question. Thank you for that. As always, you know, if you're watching this video, I'd love to hear what everybody else thinks about these questions too. So please, please comment. Counterpoint is a set of principles as to how to manage a musical texture. And in a certain sense, I think counterpoint is one of the most fundamental ways that you can learn how to compose. It's much more important than studying harmony, as far as I'm concerned. Because again, it teaches you how to set up a texture, how to differentiate lines from each other. Some of these things are specific to specific musical vocabularies and syntaxes and styles. And some of them are really highly abstractable and can apply to a very wide range of musical circumstances. So a lot of the basic principles of counterpoint, I believe they apply regardless of whether you're writing a fugue in the style of Buxtehude or whether you're writing an atonal composition for four harps, it doesn't matter. This, the, the principles are the same. The principle is, what are the different ways that, that two voices or three voices or four voices can relate to each other? Well, they can move in parallel motion, oblique motion. Uh, they can move in contrary motion, similar motion. You know, those things are not dependent on matters of style or even matters of harmonic syntax. They, they apply in atonal music as well. What makes good counterpoint? Good counterpoint is vital and exciting and teeming with life and surprising and there's like there's always new interesting things happening in it it's not boring if counterpoint is boring is it's bad counterpoint you know my friend julian anderson calls that sort of really sort of stodgy academic counterpoint important counterpoint which i think is a very uh, a very funny thing how do you translate the musical ideas in your head on paper ear training <laughs> There's no mystery about that. Ear training. You, you got to have to take an ear training course uh, or just sit down at a keyboard and work on it yourself. There's lots of online courses for that, by the way. Okay, so Noah Meyer Spohr writes, well over four years ago, I asked you in what must have been one of your first Q and A's about the relationship between the works you analyze and musical tradition, giving Ligeti as a model for how such a continuum could be integrated. Needless to say, my own opinions on this question have changed substantially. 
How have your own views evolved? You've written a variety of enormous works since I've asked that question, including in the genre of song cycle, a tradition with roots at least as far back as Beethoven, if genetically much earlier. Have these works pushed you into different encounters with the musical past, be it in literal or semi-literal quotation a la Kurtag, or abbreviated phrases of reference as in Lachenmann or Schoenbeck, best for another four years? Well, thank you, Noah, and best wishes to you as well. I think that the indebtedness that I have to the works of the past and my own particular choice of antecedents, you know, in terms of what is the music that that contains things that I would like to bring forward into the future or that I'd like to find a new way of approaching, I think that those things have probably come a little bit more to the surface than some of my more recent things, for sure, and they've become more explicit. And I'm also working with those sorts of things much more consciously. You can see that, I believe, in a piece like my seventh piano piece, which you can find on SoundCloud, and I'll hopefully be releasing that on YouTube fairly soon as well. That piece uses piano figurations that are derived from Baroque keyboard music quite clearly. I mean, they're, they're not neutral things. They're, they're things that have a certain historical resonance to them. The piece doesn't sound like a Baroque piece. It's a very different sort of composition, obviously. Uh, but nevertheless, there are reminiscences of those sorts of textures and rhythmic figures in a, in a work like that. My piano piece uh, number eight does that as well. In the vocal cycle that I'm writing presently, I think it's, it's hard to get away from the fact that there are uh, resonances with, uh, with historic materials. It doesn't take the form of quotation. It takes the form of a, a recognition that there are figures, there are gestures, there are also instrumental combinations that, whether we want them to or not, have connotations. They have historical connections. I believe it's better to be aware of those things and to work with them consciously rather than to pretend they're not there and pretend that everything that flows from our pen is 100% original and uh, the product of, a, of you know, a, a completely unique individual. It is partly an individual expression, but it's also the expression of a collective culture. And once again, you know, there are things that, I mentioned this in an earlier question, are like the public property of music and musicians and, and people who listen to, to music. They're, they're public, right? And uh, it can be useful to bring a public dimension to composition. It's sort of like rhyme in poetry. That's something that doesn't belong to any poet. It's public property. Quest Quest writes, I've been reading about the classical avant-garde in the 1950s, and what I realized is, whether it be chance operations or serialism, there is a common approach to innovation that is marked by the neglect of the listening experience. First of all, am I right about this? I know they weren't always totally unconcerned about what the material eventually comes to mean for a human being. Actually, as I understand, some of the projects, such as Gesang der Jünglinge, made pretty intriguing innovations and discoveries in the field of the listening experience. I just want to know how much they really neglected it, and with what sort of works from the period. That's a bit of an assumption. Um, it's a good question, but some composers will prioritize exploration over efficiency of message delivery. And that doesn't mean that they're neglecting the listening experience. It might simply mean that they're trying to push their listeners into new territory. Does that mean that they're not going to be able to connect with the piece as rapidly? Yes, it might mean that. It might mean that a much smaller percentage of people will be able to understand or appreciate or enjoy those pieces on a first hearing. It may be that lots of people could appreciate it, but they might be unable to hear it. They might be literally unable to interpret what they're hearing because they don't recognize it, they don't know what it is. None of this means that the listening experience is being neglected. It might mean that it's being broadened. I think if, if there's a composer that really neglects the listening experience, that really doesn't care at all about the listener's uh, experience of the piece, then that is just a bad composer, period. I mean, somebody that uh, is writing things for their own amusement, maybe, maybe as a hobby, but that isn't taking the role of the composer particularly seriously. I think that any composer, even if it's John Cage, you know, I think he's very concerned with the listening experience, very, very concerned about what experience somebody would have of a piece of his. It's just that it's not the same experience as listening to a Beethoven piano sonata. It's a fundamentally different experience, and that's part of the point. But if someone's just writing stuff that's boring because there's nothing happening, they have nothing to say because they're just repeating the same cliches endlessly, you know, and that happens a lot in pop music. I think that's the sort of music that is unconcerned with the listening experience. Sam Dyke writes, I have two questions. I've been really enjoying the Tubular West recently, and I was wondering whether or not you were considering making another singer-songwriter type album in the future. And the second question is, and I'm sorry that it's quite candid, how hard is it to make a living as a composer? Yeah, I have no immediate plans to make another record even remotely like the Tubular West. That's a complicated story. I did that record because 
as some of you may know, I started out actually as a singer-songwriter. I did quite a lot of that. I made seven or eight albums, I can't remember anymore, when I was living in Toronto. And the Tubular West came quite a lot later. It came 12 or 13 years after the last one of those that I had done. And I felt that I had unfinished business. I felt that there were things that I had since learned that I could apply to the song format, that it would be interesting to explore. And I felt haunted by a sense that I needed to do that, that I needed to tie together some of the things I'd learned as a composer with some of the more vernacular forms of expression that I'd been exploring earlier in my career. So I did the Tubular West as a kind of tying up of those loose knots, I suppose, but it's not something that I feel like I need to do again. I feel like I, you know, that, that's a fairly long album. It's like a 54 minute long record, I think. And I think I said everything I had to say in that direction in that album. Maybe I could do another one. I could do some variations on that idea, but I have lots of other things to do. I have things that I've not done at all. So I don't want to do, again, something that I've already done. I don't find that to be an interesting approach to take. It's like I've, I've done that. Maybe I could even do it better someday, but the problem there also is I find it increasingly hard to connect with that world simply because that album, you know, that was 10 years ago. I'm not the same person now, so... It's not easy, nor is it necessarily desirable to try to reconnect with things like that from, from a long time ago. It's better to move forward. That's my feeling about it. How hard is it to make a living as a composer? I'm doing okay, um, but it's really hard. Yeah, it's super hard. Incredibly hard, but anything worth doing is hard. What can I say? Life is incredibly hard. Uh, you know, I don't think it's easier to be a plumber than it is to be a composer. I don't think it's easier to be a lawyer than it is to be a composer. I don't think it's easier to be a bus driver. Maybe the difference with being a composer is there are a lot of people who want to do it and, it, and statistically speaking, most of them will not succeed. That's true. That's partly a question of, you know, are you obsessed enough to keep doing it despite near certainty of failure? Like, do you, are you convinced that it's worth trying to do even though you're probably not going to succeed? And I think that the, the composers that keep on doing it, the survivors, the ones that somehow or another find a way, despite the odds, of continuing to carve out that space where they can practice that art and keep making it, you know, and, and do that over the years and decades and just not stop. That's really what makes the composer, that's what makes the artist, and a lot of people give up. A lot of people give up, you know, when it starts to get difficult. And you can understand why that is. I, I'm certainly not pointing any fingers. There's a hundred thousand reasons why it would be a good idea to stop, but it's those, it's those few crazy people who just can't let go of it and will do anything to put those circumstances together so that they can keep on writing music you know uh, those are the ones that who, whose music we're listening to for better or for worse and here's the very last one at the top of your head what's your favorite modern classical slash contemporary work that involves diatonicism or tonality oh um probably de stadt by louis andreessen is a good example. I really like that piece. But another work that I heard recently that really impressed me, that's a little bit in that genre, in that vein, is Let Me Tell You by Hans Abrahamsen, the Danish composer. There's lots of people reinvigorating tonality and, and diatonicism and triadic harmony in all kinds of surprising ways, which in itself is not a surprising thing because it's an incredibly elastic way to write music. There's a lot still to be done. You know, the famous quip by Schoenberg that there's lots of music still to be written in C major. It's still true. Still absolutely true. And you would hope that composers would take that approach and expand upon it and see, can I do something genuinely surprising, something that nobody's ever done before in C major? That would be an accomplishment, and I would be the first person to want to hear it. So, as ever, thank you for all of the brilliant questions. Thank you for following the channel. If you like this video, if you like what I do, please subscribe to the channel and like the video. That'll help me to keep on doing it. And if you really like what I'm doing, you can go on to Patreon and check out the rewards that I'm offering for your support. And again, thank you for watching, and we'll see you again soon.